Amen. So I'm excited. We are starting a new season, a new month with a new series. Hallelujah. Can I get a hallelujah, somebody? Last month, we covered the Inner Life series. We went through it for two months, so you better know what we're talking about. We went through what, fam? Say it with power and conviction. Thank you. Evan, what did we go through? Warfare. And we learned how to battle in the arena of our mind, our thoughts, our emotions. We learned how to take back what the enemy has tried to steal, kill, and destroy. Can I get an amen, somebody? We learned how to fight against the root issue, more than just the external issue, but the root issues that is causing the things in our life to be misaligned with God. Amen? It's Oftentimes, it's our own self. It's our own flesh. Really, the problem is me. Right? Is that true of yourself? Let yourself know the problem is me. And we get in our way of what God desires over our life. And so we learn how to battle against it. And as we come into this next series, this is how we continue to live out in the promises of God. We've taken back what the enemy has stolen, but then how do you keep the promises of God in your life? How do you keep? What do you think? Anyone know? Who was here yesterday? Who knows what I'm talking about? It's through obedience. Amen. It's not meaning that you get to fulfill the law and do all the right things as if it's a check mark checklist, but a life of obedience. It's the very thing that the Lord desires. Amen. Let me put up my slides. When I say obedience, you think what? You can discuss amongst yourselves for like two, two, two minutes, one minute, one minute, Two minutes. Go ahead. Turn around. When I say obedience, what do you think? Go ahead. Just discuss what comes to your mind. First thoughts. First thoughts. Think quick. Share with each other. Obedience. I hear what? I think of what? What comes to mind? 30 more seconds to discuss. What comes to mind? And then I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. All righty. I am coming here. Isaac, what do you think? When I say obedience, you think? Oh, follow King's orders. Follow King's orders. Interesting. Okay, cool, cool, cool. When I th say obedience, you think? Action. Action. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. When I say obedience, Jojo, you think? Um, like listening to your parents. Okay. That's a good one. Practical. Listen to your parents. When I say obedience, Hannah, you think? I like to hear the brother and sister response. My dad. Your dad. All right. Okay. Authority. When I say obedience, you think? Also my parents. My parents. Got to obey those parents. Last but not least, Sam, when I say obedience, you think? Uh, submission. Submission. Okay, cool. Give yourself a round of applause. Very cool. Very cool. You guys were more guai guai about it. But when I heard the word obedience, let me tell you, when I first heard the message of obedience, I was like, uh-oh, like, am I in a cult? Like, <laughs> where am I? When I heard obedience, I was like, my initial gut reaction was like, I don't want to do it. N no. <laughs> I, I thought obedience was something like, if you have to do it, some of you said your parents, right? And that oftentimes, that first relationship we have with our parents, we get this image of what obedience looks like. And if you grew up in my home, if you didn't obey, you weren't just punished. You were old school punished. You know what I mean by old school punished? Meaning your backside showed whether or not you were obedient. 
Like I got smacked around. If I was not obedient, I left a sock on the ground, my butt would receive the consequences. You know what I mean? And so for me, the idea of obedience is abuse. It's like a slave driver. If I don't do what my parents tell me to do, if I don't do what my father tells me to do, I'm going to be desperately and deeply punished. So when I hear obedience, this in immediate fleshly fear reaction comes in me. Do you know what I mean? Like, like I need to watch myself, right? Do you all of a sudden start to like straighten up your tie, like straighten up your shirt? You hear obedience, they're like, oh, teacher's watching. Mom and dad are looking. I better be doing the right thing. But this is not the obedience of what Jesus came to demonstrate. And this is not the obedience of the message of inner life. What is obedience? Let's take a look at Isaiah 53, five through seven. Let's read it together. We all are like what? We all are like sheep. Who has ever experienced or been around or met a sheep? They are cute. They are fluffy. What? They're delicious, yes. But there's really not much going on in between their ears, right? Like, be honest, they are probably some of the dumbest creatures on planet Earth. And yet this is whom Jesus compares us to. We are sheep. We are sheep. And why does he compare us to sheep? Sheep have a terrible sense of direction, like the worst ever. There have been literal documents of like history of sheep literally running off cliffs because they're afraid. Like they hear something, like it's just like a big th thunder crash or something, and they all run off the cliff. Like no hesitation like this happens yeah or they're like oh that looks delicious and it's an entire like thorn bush and they get themselves all caught up and cut up in it like this is what sheep do they go by their like tummies they do like they they have no direction they have no vision and they end up hurting themselves and who do god who does god see us as our sheep and if we're really honest if we recognize on our own we really are we are like sheep without a shepherd we go astray and we all turn we all want our own way like we're all these independent sheep like i know the way to the fancy nice plushy pasture lands that chris was talking about but where do we end up we'll end up in the desert for 40 years like that's what we do the Lord in his infinite amount of kindness, in his patience, in his love, he laid down himself to demonstrate to us what obedience looks like. He is the good shepherd. Tell your neighbor he's the good shepherd. And I love that actually Chris, not knowing my message, picked that verse for you to wait on the Lord for because the Lord is fully in control. He is the good shepherd. And he came on the earth to teach us how to live a life fully obedient to God. Not lip service, not just doing the outward things, but fully obedient. I have this video I want to show you real quick about the Lord being a good shepherd. I know this picture of Jesus carrying little lamb on his shoulders. And you know how we associate that with, oh, Jesus is so loving. And we're just this cute little lamb. Oh, I'm just a cute little baby lamb. And Jesus is going to carry me around on his shoulders where I can be safe and protected forever and ever. Well, do you know why shepherds would carry lambs on their neck like that? So when the shepherd had an issue with one of his baby lambs who, let's say, wouldn't listen, wouldn't pay attention, was always running away, what the shepherd would do is take the baby lamb 
and break its legs. When the baby lamb's legs were broken, they couldn't walk. So the shepherd would pick the baby lamb up and carry him around the shoulders. This kept the baby lamb close to the shepherd's heart. He would learn the shepherd. He would learn to love the shepherd. He would learn to stay close to the shepherd. He would learn to be obedient to the shepherd. So by the time the baby lamb's legs were healed, he was doing well. And when the shepherd would say it's time to go, when the shepherd would say it's time to eat, when the shepherd would say stop, when the shepherd would say follow me, the lamb would be obedient. Because he remembered the last time when he wasn't, how his legs were broken. Jesus ain't no joke. Let's not get our limbs broken. Amen. So what he's talking about, and we could just put up that picture. You've, you guys have seen that, right? Jesus carrying the sweet baby lamb. You're like, oh, Jesus, he's such a good shepherd. He's so sweet. He carries us. Look how closely. Look how sweetly. But you know what got that lamb on his shoulder? That baby lamb was wandering off, not listening. He doesn't trust God in his boundary lines. He doesn't trust the shepherd being a good shepherd and leading him well. He gets himself in trouble. He gets himself like chased after. And what does Jesus do? He leaves the 99 and he goes after that one. He doesn't leave one behind. He goes after that one. And in order to teach that lamb on how to trust him, he has to do something that hurts him really than more than it hurts us. He'll break one of the legs, not because he wants to inflict pain or injury, but because that lamb is stubborn and independent and not willing to listen to the voice of his shepherd, to trust him, that he's there to protect them. Do you know what shepherds did in the time of Jesus? They literally lived with their sheep. They lived with them night and day. They would sleep on the fields with their sheep. They would watch them 24 hours. Their life was their sheep. You know, we think about David out there on the field, like singing songs to the Lord, like he and defending bears and lions for the sake of his sheep. Who would fight off a bear to save a sheep? Anyone? Any y'all? How many of you would defend a sheep from a lion? You would stand in the way. Who would do that? None of us, right? But David was a man after God's own heart, and he was willing. This is how much he loved his sheep. So you got to know when he broke that sheep's leg and put him on his shoulders, he was wanting the sh the, he's wanting to hold that lamb so close that he would learn to trust the voice. More than the voice, he would learn to trust his shepherd's heartbeat. Do you see where the head is laid? It's always close to the heart of Jesus. Whenever you see this picture, you'll always see the head is always on the left side. Why? It's for us to learn to listen and trust the shepherd's heart. Amen? So this is what a life of obedience is all about. It's learning to trust the shepherd of our soul. That he, he loves us so much that he laid down his life for us. If you go back to the previous part of Isaiah he was crushed for our iniquities. He was persecuted for the sake of us. He took it upon himself, our yoke of sin and death. This is how desperately he loves us. And so he came on the earth to show us a life of obedience, a life laid down. Let's go to the next slide. So through obedience, he teaches us to trust his voice. Exodus 19, 5, let's read it. There, therefore, come on. You shall be among all peoples, and you shall be when do we become his treasured possession? When we obey and it's lived out by us keeping his commandments. The way he holds us close to his heart, he wants us to hold every word that he speaks to us close to our heart. Let's go to the next slide. 
We are in a covenantal relationship. Tell your neighbor, we're in a covenantal relationship. And in this beautiful covenantal relationship, you know, it speaks in in Psalms how he hangs on every word. Psalm 139, it speaks about the Lord's thoughts towards you. How many thoughts does he have towards you as a good shepherd? Do you know how many? Anyone got an estimation? How many thoughts that the Lord has towards you? He numbered them. He told us. More than the sands on the seashore. More than the sands on the seashore are the shepherd's thoughts towards us. And yet how many of our thoughts are turned towards him? He clings on every word that comes out of our mouth. It says in scripture, even before we utter a word, he already knows what we need. Even before you utter a word, he's thinking of you. Isn't that crazy? Even now, Jesus says, day and night, what is Jesus doing right now? He's interceding for you before his father's throne. And yet for us, how many of us treasure and cling to the word of God? Let's go to the next slide. Jesus came to demonstrate a life of complete obedience. Can you read John 4, 34 for me? With power and conviction. Let's stand. So they'll wake you up. Let's stand and declare it. Ready? One, two, three, go. Jesus said, my food and to accomplish, stay standing, declare it two more times. Jesus said to them is to do and to accomplish One more time with power and conviction. Jesus, my food, tell your neighbor, amen. All right, have a seat. So what satisfied the Lord more than a gen buffet or Korean barbecue? Or any food that you can imagine on this earth. I mean, I used to watch that YouTube. You guys ever see that? Like, where they compared the, I forgot the name of the the series. You probably all know. Where they went out to like, they went out out to eat like $10 food, and then $100 food, and then like $1,000 food. It's worth it. Thank you. Thank you. So they try all these kinds of food to try to determine which one was worth it. It was interesting. Sometimes like the $10, you know, road stop at the side of the road tastes better than a thousand dollar Wagyu, blah, 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 blah food, you know? Anyways, you know, we look at that and we think, oh, wow, I can only imagine, you know, dropping 10 grand for a meal. I don't know about that. But, you know, and we think that those things are so satisfying. I mean, they, they make it look so satisfying. You watch. I feel like most of it's just the show. You watch the chef, like, with the tweezers, like the little, this, this one grain of salt was mined by these people with tiny hands <laughs> and it was it was cultivated for a thousand generations you know that one little piece of salt and you're like Ooh. like i don't know i don't know but you think that these things are all satisfying but it's smoke and mirrors is what i'm saying it's smoke and mirrors and eventually where does all our food go where did it go Exactly. Toilet. Whoever said toilet, thank you. It, it goes out into waste. So, I mean, really. But Jesus said, what satisfies him? What sustains him? What drives him is to do what? The will of my father. To live in obedience. Tell your neighbor, to live in obedience. This is what Jesus came on the earth to demonstrate to us. Let's go to the next slide. And he said this to us in John 15, before the hour where he was to be imprisoned for our sake, before he was to be crucified, tortured for our sake, he said this to us. Let's read it with power and conviction. If you, you will abide in my love.
You are my friends if... See, obedience isn't about me following a bunch of rules that I can never measure up to. It's not living up to a standard that I can never obtain and being punished and tortured if I don't measure up to it. It's not about just doing all the things that people expect of me. Obedience is being a friend. Tell your neighbor, obedience is being a friend. Um, Can you guys remember, like, the most precious conversations you've had with your best friend? Like, your closest friend, your bosom buddy. Do you guys have bosom buddies? Who's your bestest friend? Well, now my bosom buddy and my bestest friend is my husband. And some of my favorite, favorite, like, times with him was just, like, heart-to-heart conversations where he would share so deeply and so honestly about his life. But then he would so intently listen to details of mine. And then on on like a random day, we're just doing something very normal, he remembered something that I said, like something really insignificant. He would be like, oh yeah, I remember you told me you did that with Ruthie. I'd be like, oh. And I just start crying because I'm like, he remembered, you know? Or like, I remember, I think it was our second date, our second date or a third date, second date maybe. We were at Mandra. We recently, last week, got to take some of the young adults. You guys been in Mandra Tea House? Really good. I think one of the best shave ice in, in our area, my opinion. But anyways, we were there like our second date. And I was terribly sick. I should not have been. <laughs> I think I had the flu. And so I had the whole mask. And this is during COVID, you know. So we really shouldn't have been there. But I really, really wanted. I was before COVID. I really wanted to spend time with him. Anyways, I'm trying my best. I'm on tons of flu medication. And so the whole time I'm like praying while we're having this conversation. Because I really want to know this man. I really want to know who he is. And so I'm like, I'm like, I'm like kind of like nasally and like kind of foggy in my brain. I'm like, Lord, what question should I ask? And like, I'm really (laughs) congested. But then like the Lord tells me, oh, ask him what his favorite childhood memory, like with your, his grandparents. It's very specific. And I was like, oh, that's very specific. Okay, I'm going to ask him. And I'm like, what is your favorite like childhood memory with your grandparents? And he's like, (laughs) And he started crying already, right away. This is like our second date. I'm like, oh, no, what did I say? <laughs> and then he's like, you know, because he has such a deep relationship with his grandparents. And, like, he's so connected. Like, he loves them deeply, and both of his grandparents have passed. And so he, would t- he was telling me, he was just telling me the story with his grandpa and how he would vlog on their way to do, like, stuff. Like, I'm going with grandpa to the bank. And he would take, like, a video of, like, him and grandpa to the bank. And, like, he was so touched because I'm, like, listening and I'm actually wanting to know him. This is obedience. I really want to know God. I want to know him as an intimate friend. So I hang on every word that he says. And when he says it, I want to know more about him. Like, God, why do you say that? Why do you say that? I want to know more about you. I want to know your heart when you say this. And you say this is for me. You want me to obey my mom and dad. I don't want to just be like, okay, I'm going to obey my mom and dad. Like, Lord, I want to know why you say this. What is on your heart when I learn to obey my parents? Do you go deeper that way? That's what true friendship and a life of obedience is. I'm hanging on every word. Are you understanding it? Are you getting it? Nod with me if you're getting it. That's why it's so beautiful. It's not I have to, but I get to. A life of obedience is I get to. And I want to be called his friend, his intimate friend, that know the depths of his heart, that press in to know the depths of his heart. Most of us will just treat conversations with the Lord very one-sided. 
We don't go to the depths of his heart. We go to, okay, tell me what I'm supposed to do. And let me just do those things. So then I can get into heaven. Or I can get, you know, a blessing from you. We treat him how Saul treated him. Y'all remember how Saul treated him? If you don't remember, we're going to go back into 1 Samuel. Let's read it together. How did Saul treat the Lord's words? Let's read it. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. Let's pause. So have you guys done that to the Lord? Like, yeah, Lord, I did all those things. Or I, More like, have you said this to your parents? Yeah, Mom, I cleaned my room. I did the thing. You told me to do this thing. I did all the things, right? Let's continue. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things, devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. All right, let's pause. So why is he saying that? Because he got caught not doing what he promised the Lord to do. Any of you guys get caught by your parents or by your boss or by your spouse doing the thing that you're not supposed to do? Like you did it halfway, right? Like your mom said, clean up your room. And you're like, yeah, mom, I was cleaning up my room. But then I got this email about blah, blah, blah. And I got distracted, right? Any of you guys have done that? Or like, my sibling decided to like throw a bunch of stuff everywhere. It's not my fault. It's his fault or her fault. You guys do that? Or boss, it's not my fault. I tried to finish a project on time, but my coworkers were slacking off. They didn't do their piece, right? Or hubs, I was planning to do the laundry and do the vacuum cleaning, but then I got pulled into a meeting. And I just didn't have enough time. I'm sorry. I got really, really busy. You guys get there? You, you've had those conversations? All right, so we have all been in Saul's position. But what does the word of the Lord through the prophet Samuel say? What is he after? You just doing partially what God wants? You doing it flippantly like, I'm just going to do whatever, but then if things get in the way, maybe I'll let it go? What does Samuel say? Has the Lord... And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Behold, and to listen, for rebellion is as, and presumption is as, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord does not mince words. Because he's not after a people who will just be flippant with his word. Who treat it so casually as if it's a suggestion. Or make excuses When we get caught, the reality is when things get exposed and it's his kindness to expose them, rather than having repentant hearts, we excuse away our disobedience and our rebellion as if it's permissible. It's like not a big deal. So what if I didn't obey my mom? Like so what if I didn't listen to my boss? So what if I didn't follow everything that God says in his word? So what? What happens to the people that say, so what? Our hearts start to become harder and harder. Our hearts become more and more rigid. The more you give your heart and your life excuses to not obey God, the more and more your flesh will rise. And eventually you will get to the point where I don't care what God says. We see those things on like TikTok, social media, all the time. People being like, whatever, I don't need religion. I'm my own boss, right? I, I, I don't know. I don't know the phrases in the Gen Z. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> like, I can help myself, basically. I can do these things for myself. You know, I define myself. This is my truth. My truth. 
my truth. I'm just speaking my truth. You guys hear that all the time? Like, it's just my truth. But if I have a truth and you have a truth and our truths are opposing each other, what is, what is the truth? I mean, we get so diluted and confused and you wonder, how did we get there? Ask your neighbor, how did we get there? How do we get to such a dark and crooked and depraved generation who don't even know what truth is anymore? It's because we do not uphold his word. We don't treasure it, and we don't treat it like deep friendship. We treat it like a bunch of barking orders. Yes, sir. And when we don't do it, we are like, well... It's not that big of a deal. Are those the type of people that God can trust his heart to? But what about the man after God's own heart, David? If you consider his life, I mean, if you weigh out Saul's sin to David's sin, probably in our eyes, who did the more heinous thing? The guy who, like, let the people do what they wanted and didn't fully obey God. Or David who committed adultery, murdered, and lied about it. Who do you think? Or tried to cover it up. Most of us in our eyes, murder is definitely worse than disobedience. But see, the Lord does not look to outward appearances. He looks to the heart. When David was confronted with his sin by the prophet Nathan, this is what he responded in Psalm 51. When his sin was exposed, we get to see where his heart is. Remember Saul. What did Saul do? Made excuses, blamed other people, and said it's like it's not a big deal. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Let's see what, when he was confronted with what he did to Bathsheba, how he, she, he killed her husband, this is how he responded. Let's read it out loud. Declare it together. Wash me and cleanse me, for you do not sacrifice. You will not be pleased. The sacrifices of God a broken and a contrite heart. You know, further in Psalm 51, he says, Lord, put a right spirit in me. I need your help. It's the most desperate, beautiful psalm of repentance. God, I need you, and I need your help. I know it's you whom I've hurt the most. It's you whom I've hurt the most. I will not excuse what I've done I didn't uphold your word. I hurt others, but I have hurt you the most. God, forgive me. I need you. I shared with the young adults about, I think, I don't know if I've talked to you guys about, have you heard of the five apology languages? Yeah? Have you heard of that? Have you heard of the five love languages? Yes. So there are actually also five apology languages. Did you know that? You should check it out on your free time. But five love languages is like acts of service, quality time, words of affirmation, physical touch, and gifts. I always forget that one because it's like my least. <laughs> like gifts. Okay. So those are like the five love languages. But the five apology languages, like there are actual languages where you like try to do like a ramification, like you um, like ask, I, I'm really bad at it. You ask like really deep apology. There's a bunch basically. What's really interesting is I think I think because of David's deep, deep friendship with God, his deep, deep conversation and relationship, the way that he converses and, and treasures every one of God's words, he understands God's apology language. Do you get what I mean? He gets God's repentance language. 
How did he know that God does not delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Was he there when, he, when Saul was told that by Samuel? Did he overhear that conversation? I don't think so. He would not have known that that's what the prophet was told. But he knew God's heart. Do you guys see it? He knew God's heart. God's not after me trying to make up for my mistakes. He's not after me trying to excuse it. He's after a sincere heart that wants to live in obedience. Let's read Colossians 3, 22 through 24. Let's declare it. Bond servants in everything... Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the and not for, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your, you are serving. I encourage you to memorize this verse because it's so powerful. When we honor those whom God has put above us, when we honor the Lord through honoring our parents, through honoring our bosses, through honoring even spiritual leaders over us, when we honor those whom God has installed over our life, who are we serving? We're serving the Lord. And we don't do it as people pleasers. What do people pleasers do? They people please. Very good. Thank you, Bethany. Yes. Which is exactly what Saul did. He gave the people what they wanted. He feared man more than he feared God. Do you guys see it? That's why he lived in the rebellion and the witchcraft of disobedience. He cared more about other people's opinions than he cared about God's. He lived a life who did not fear God or treasure the words of God. And so is that what the Lord is after? Is he after a bunch of people pleasers? He's after people who give eye service. Do you know what eye service is? Anyone know? If I'm looking at you, y'all are taking notes. And you're like being diligent. But I turn my back and y'all doodling. You open the apps that, that you closed and you thought I didn't see, right? You go back to playing your game. Am I hitting some like stressor points over there? You get what I mean? That is eye service. Because are you actually taking notes because you're deeply wanting to know what's on God's heart, are you doing it because somebody's watching you do it? Do you get it? I service means I'm doing it because someone's watching me. But when nobody's watching me, what do I do? When I'm alone in my room and no one else is there, what do I do? Do I just read my Bible? Do I bring my Bible to church because Mishi's like going to call me out because I brought my Bible? Like I want her to be like, yay, look. Or do you like treasure his word? When you're in your closet and you're at home by yourself, are you weeping? Are you weeping over his words because they're so beautiful and you treasure them so deeply? Have you ever cried at the word of God? Literally, I have, I have literal pages where it's tear marked. Like, you could see tear marks on my Bible. And I'm not showing this to, like, brag, but it's like literally there have been times where God's word hit me so deep, I'm just wrecked. I'm just wrecked. And snot and tears, everything's coming out, and I don't care what I look like because his word is wrecking me deep. He's not after eye service. Tell your neighbor, he's not after eye service. He doesn't want you just to do the right thing because somebody's watching you. He wants you to delight in being with him. He's after friends, guys. Can I get an amen? Tell your neighbor, he's after a friend. 
Let's go to the next slide. So are we giving eye service? I think I got that right. Did I say that right? Are we giving eye service? Is that right? That's the phrase. Is it giving? Right? Is that right? I don't know. <laughs> I'm looking at my Gen Zers and they're laughing at me. I'm sorry. Okay. Is it giving eye service or is it giving sincerity? If you would measure your life, <laughs> it's like, sorry. Okay. If the Lord would truly look at your life, what does it look like? Is it a life of obedience? Are you like a sheep that's wandered off and the Lord in this time wants to discipline you because he loves you and put boundary lines? Where are you? John 14, 21, let's declare it. Whoever he it is who and he who loves me and I will love him and manifest Who is it that loves the Lord? It's the ones that treasure his word. Not just when people watch them. It's not because I'm trying to earn approval from my leaders, approval from my friends, approval from my parents. I do it because I love him deeply. And I want to learn how to love him deeply. So I treasure him. I treasure what he says. And when I fail and mess up, I will fail and mess up. I don't make excuses. I don't try to tell myself it's not a big deal. I don't try to lessen the blow of my failure, but I run to him and I say, God, I need your mercy. I need your loving kindness. I can't do it on my own. I don't make excuses for not treasuring your word. I come to the mercy seat and I cry out, God, help me with sincerity. Because I'd rather be a friend of the Lord than a friend to the world. Amen? I wonder if there are other ones in this room that would amen with me. I want to be a friend to Jesus more than a friend to the world. Yeah, the next slide. In the end, do we only obey because we're being watched? Or do we delight to obey because it's for the Lord? I'm going to take some time just waiting on the Lord. We're going to ask him, why do I obey? Is it just because I think that that's what's expected of me? I want to be that guai guai kid. Did I say it right? Guai guai. Is it fourth tone? First tone. Guai guai. Yeah? Woohoo. Do I want to just be that guai guai kid that's doing all the right things? But in the end, I'm just like Saul. I'm just doing it because I'm trying to please man. Or I'm trying to please myself and thinking that somehow I'm good. You know, another one, another character in the Bible that just did eye service was the, in the story of the prodigal son, it was the older son. He was in the father's house. He did everything the father said. But he did it out of his own selfish ambition. Like, I want things for myself. And he did it just because he wants the father's approval. But he didn't do it out of a heart of obedience, out of this heart of friendship. He did it out of expectation. I'm the older son, so I have to do these things. He did it begrudgingly, thinking that somehow he would earn something from the Father. But we don't have to earn anything from Jesus. He already gave it all for us. Amen? Worship team, can you come help? I spent some time just before the Lord. Going back to the beginning, when it comes to obedience, what is my heart response?
Do I get fearful because I think it's some something that I have to measure up to, but I can never live up to it? When it comes to obedience, am I just giving eye service? Am I just doing it for the praise of man? Lord, examine my heart. Search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Just take some time. Ask the Lord. time with him. Don't just do it because Misha asked you to do it. Ask yourself, do you want a deep friendship with the Lord? don't do this because I ask you, but because you really want to live a life of obedience, I want to come back to his heart. Just invite you, if you want to respond to him, you can come to the front, you can kneel, you can sit, or even if you just want to move around in the room, I just invite you, you don't have to stay in that place. If you're talking, if you're having a conversation, if the Lord is speaking to you, then you can stay where you are, but I just invite you just to come to the front or come to the sides just spend some time to really go deep into the lord lord examine my heart examine my heart help me jesus i don't want to give eye service i don't want to just give you what is convenient i want to live a life of obedience excuses. You know the Lord's called you out. He called you to to measure your time, to not make excuses for wasting it. He called you to share the gospel with your friends. He called you to set him as a first priority. But you've made so many excuses. I just want to invite you to come before the Lord. 
Jesus, Lord, forgive me. I've treated you like a slave driver. I've treated you like a taskmaster. And Jesus, you are my good shepherd. week I was asking the Lord, Lord, what is on your heart? What is the thing that you want the most? What is the thing you care about the most? Just in my living room, I was just talking with him, and the Lord suddenly brought me back. It was almost like I was literally there. He brought me back to when I was 23 years old. In Bushwick, Brooklyn. I was living in this house that was completely run down. We had no running toilet. Our shower didn't work. But I was there because the Lord said, Come, follow me. I remember it was like three, four in the morning. Everyone in the house was asleep. And I climbed up to the top, the roof of our building. I sat there stillness and the quiet. I just leaned in. I leaned into his heart and I said, Jesus, I just want what you want. No matter what it may cost, I just want what you want. No matter the price, I want what you want. I want what's on your heart. That memory was always something really deep a treasured encounter that I had with the Lord where I knew that all I wanted was Him and nothing else mattered. I didn't know how much that moment meant to Him. 
So as I was sitting in my living room two weeks ago, the Lord said, I saw you. And it meant something to me. That's what I want. That's what I want. The simple, beautiful heart of whatever it costs, whatever the price, I was willing to say yes for his presence, whatever it would take. And so he plucked out this scared little 23-year-old Mishi from New York, New Jersey. He plucked me out, and I sold everything I had just to come and follow him. something to me when you left your family behind and you left everything behind just to be with me just to know my heart and then I heard him say Mishi I call you friend you to come forward and say, yes, Lord, no matter the cost, I want to live a life fully obedient. I want to live a life fully trusting you, God. No more excuses, but I want to live a life right in wholehearted obedience to who you are. Just invite you to come. Sit, kneel, just be before him. Say, Jesus, yes. I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. This small act of obedience of just coming and just saying yes. I'm kneeling and just coming before him in this altar. There's no hype. There's no crazy music happening. It's just a simple call. Jesus, I want to be your friend. And no matter what it costs, to be your friend, I am willing. I won't make excuses. I want to live a life of total obedience. treasures every word, hangs on every word that you speak and that you do. And I don't want to do it because I have to. I want to do it because I get to. I want to love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. Jesus, I want to be your friend. the cost, no matter the price, Lord, it's worth it to be your friend.
talking with the Lord and he's speaking to you just keep talking with him I feel like there's some in the room there's some in the room you hear the word obedience and there's all this fear and anxiety this pressure like I can never amount to this thing and I really believe the Lord wants to break this yoke of performance it's not about you doing a bunch of things to win approval to get the yes to get the blessing it's not about just measuring up to something. You just see the Lord breaking rulers and breaking yokes off of people's backs, this pressure to perform. Others in the room, you want to trust God. You want to trust his word, but you just don't know. You hear Psalm 23, you hear he's a good shepherd, but much of your life experience, you haven't you haven't seen him this way. You haven't experienced him this way, but you want to. There's this little yes in you that's saying, I want to trust you and I want to learn to trust you. For those, the Lord is saying, come. There's one thing you can test me in. See me in the faithfulness of my word. And so it's just learning and surrender. I feel some of you just, Lord, I'm, gonna tr I'm willing to try and I'm willing to trust you even though it feels risky and it feels so vulnerable I'm going to I'm going to trust you God you're a good shepherd and you know what you're doing I'm not just going to go and wander off in my independence and do my own thing anymore I want to come with you others in the room you've been marked the Lord sees you and you are saying yes I want to have this deep friendship I want to care every word that you speak I want to carry it in my heart and I want to go after you with everything that is in me with all that I have I want to be a true friend after your after your own heart the Lord says I see you I see that beautiful yes and it moves me it moves me. I can just hear him. I can feel like literal tears of how moved he is by your yes. You need to know. Wherever you are, though, he wants to speak to you. I want to invite you guys to find two or three others in the room. Which group are you in? Are you the, the I want to obey, but it feels like there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of, a lot of conditions, and I feel like it's hard. I... I feel like I can never measure up, but I want to try. But the Lord is breaking that yoke off me. Performance. I don't want to have this performance. Number two, the I know he's a good shepherd, and I want to trust him as one, but I just don't know. Oh, but I want to try. I want to learn to trust him. You're in that second group. First group, again, the performance, God breaking performance to learn a life of obedience. Second group learning to trust. God, I want to trust you. You are the good shepherd. Last, I can feel the Lord is wooing me into this sweet and deep friendship. I can just feel him calling me into this life of obedience to be a friend after his heart. Find two or three in the room and just pray together. Can you do that? Two or three in the room.
I want you to pray for that other person, but I also want you to pray for yourself because it's powerful when you hear it coming out of your own words. Lord, yes, I want to commit to friendship with you. A life of obedience is friendship with you. A life of obedience, treasuring your words, caring for the things on your heart, learning to trust you as the good shepherd of my soul. other I find myself in one of those three groups or if you're not you're somewhere else just share with each other this is where I am right now when it comes to living in obedience for each other, but you can begin by praying for yourself. Lord, this is where I am. When it comes to friendship and obedience to you, this is where I am. Be honest. Lord, it's really hard. I make a lot of excuses. It's really hard to obey you. Sometimes it just feels like the last thing, the last thing I want to do is to obey you. The last thing I want to do is follow you. Be honest with the Lord. Be like David. Be sincere. Be honest. Lord, this is where I am. I want to love you. I want to trust you, but it's hard. And after you pray, let yours who are around you, you can pray in response. Say, the Lord sees your heart. He honors your heart. He leaves the nine to go, 99 to go after you. He's after your heart. It's because we know how deep is his love, how committed he is to pursuing after us that we can so freely respond in love and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want to come after you the way that you come after me. Thank you, Jesus.
are you allowed? Is it a life laid down? And here I give my vows. Is it a song I sing? And here's every melody. Just tell me what moves you. Just tell me what moves you. Is it a fragrance? Is it a life laid down? Then here I give my vows. Is it a song I sing? And here's every melody. Just tell me what moves you. Tell me what moves you. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Precious Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful. You are my treasure, my great reward. Jesus, Jesus. Offering all my ambitions, my hopes, my dreams, and here's my life, Lord, a sacrifice, oh, just to bless you. I just want to move your heart. That's all I want to do, I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you, no matter how much the cost, I freely give it all to you, all to you, I just want to God within your gaze, your presence, Lord, is where I want to stay, oh, just to dwell in your house, waste my hours and my days on you.
touches your heart, God. This sweet friendship we get to have with you, Jesus. Lord, I ask you, Holy Spirit, give us a grace. Give us a grace, supernatural grace, to be able to obey and respond to you with a burning heart. To respond to you in the way that you respond to us, in the way that you move towards us. Lord, we want to respond with that same burning heart. Lord, I just bless this family out of John 14, 21. Lord, as you said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. You will manifest yourself to us as we lean in with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength to live out in obedience. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to say yes, and more than say yes, but to live out that yes. Lord, through obedience, we thank you. We learn to treasure your words. We get to treasure Lord, everything you have given up and given for us. So Lord, I just bless my family. Help us to live out the love you've given us with sincerity, with the fear of the Lord. To give back to you what you've given to us. We thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. We just bless you, family. If you're still praying with one another, continue. You can continue to bless pray for one another so next week we will be here but just as a reminder on the four on the 15th june 15th we will be combined service for our passover feast starting on the 14th pentecost, pentecost sorry what did i say passover. passover sorry we're in pentecost now hallelujah for our Pentecost feast, we want to invite you to join us, 14, 15, 16. And again, encourage you to register for the Inner Life Feast Conference in July, the Pure Conference in August. We want to press into everything that the Lord has for us. Bless you, family. Make sure you bless a few before you go.
will not bring that which cost me nothing. You've given more than I deserve. You a love that's burning only because you love me first. I will not bring that which cost
Tell me what moves you. Tell me what moves you. Is it a fragrance that I'll pour? my hours and my days on you. 